Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are in this world. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon. I'm the moderator for today's webinar, and I'd like to welcome you to the evolution of application release automation by Datacle and Zevia Labs. Um, before we get started on today's webinar, I do have a couple housekeeping things that we need to go over. Um, first of all, we are going to have three polling questions during today's event, so um, we really would love to have your input uh, and your participation in the polling questions, so uh, keep an eye out for those. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded, so uh, in about 24 hours after the event, both a link to the webinar and the slides will be made available for your enjoyment. And then um, we are going to be uh, ha taking questions throughout the entire webinar. So um, the questions will be asked near the end, but we are taking the questions at any time. If, so if you have a question for either one of our panelists at any time during the presentation, feel free to use the, uh, the control panel there to go ahead and uh, put your question in for the panelists. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, introduce our presenters today. We have Sunil, Mav Sunil Mavadia, who is Director of Customer Success at Zebia Labs. He has headed major DevOps transition projects um, at a previous position, and currently he runs the client services uh, at Zebia Labs, which includes the consulting and implementation of the Zebia Labs product suite, Excel Release, Excel Deploy, and Excel Test View. We also have Robert Reeves, who is the CTO and co-founder of Datacal. He advocates for Datacal's customers and leads Datacal technical architecture teams. Uh, he also was the Furnace Software CTO and co-founder, uh, which was an early ARA pioneer that was acquired by BMC Software. So welcome to Sunil and Robert. Thanks for uh, both of you for taking the time out today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, Great. thank so, you. <laughs> I, uh, I know we want to get things qu uh, kicked off with our first of three polling questions, so we'll go ahead and put it up on the screen. <clears throat> that should be coming up uh, as an interactive uh, poll for our audience. The question is, on average, how frequently does your organization upgrade or release new application features in a year? Uh, we have five uh, answers for you to select from, and we'll give you guys about uh, 20 seconds or so to go ahead and uh, put in your answer, Then we'll take a quick look at the results. Also, to let you guys know that we will be uh, tweeting out the poll results during the webinar, so uh, if you don't catch the results here, check your Twitter feed and you should be able to find them there. So a couple more seconds here, and we'll take a look at the poll results, and there they are. Um, looks like at least once a month was the uh, was the leading answer. Uh, on average, how frequently does your organization upgrade or release new application features in a year? So once a month, uh, once a week uh, was second, by once a quarter, and then six months and, and once a year. So I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it over to uh, Robert and Sunil to uh, kind of get things kicked off. But um, you know, maybe we can kind of uh, use that polling question as a springboard for the conversation. So guys, uh, take it away. Sure. Robert, you want to start? You want me to go for it? Oh, absolutely. I, I would, you know, look, the thing is, we know once a month and cutting it. You know, we, we've got, um, you know, the companies that we all work for are, you know, effectively competing with Facebook. They update twice, uh, once every two weeks, right? And so we've got to get a lot faster. Um, and, and, so you know, why don't you just take us through the kind of the value of application release automation and what it's, um, you know, sure. doing for us. Sure. So uh, for anybody uh, that's on the call, uh, that no Exibia Labs, uh, we were named number one uh, in a very recent Forrester report. Uh, but Forrester kind of came out and said, you know, right in your face that ARA is a critical final step in the delivery, uh, you know, pipeline of, of your applications. Uh, that not only improves your customer experiences, but it really gets your applications, uh, you know, in a time to market time frame. Uh, shorten so that you can get your releases out a whole lot faster. We saw the poll result uh, coming in. You saw 25% mm -hmm. uh, were saying once a week. 
yeah, those are the people that have some level of automation in their pipeline. And you can see that they're starting to embrace, uh, you know, the tools and technology and people and process, right? Uh, but the fact is that the rest that you saw, uh, you know, those are the people that, that need to start embracing ERA as one of those uh, final steps in the delivery of their, of their pipeline. Uh, moving on, it, this is another poll in Forrester's Q1 report. And it shows that 4% are satisfied. But if you really think about it, <laughs> well, well, that's terrible. <laughs> exactly, right? So the point here is that that 4% kind of know where ARA is going, but the rest are floundering. Uh, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not. But the fact is that you know most people are just beginning to understand what really uh, application release automation is, right? So you have mm -hmm. some that have absolutely no clue and don't know how to start, right? And then some that kind of know where, where, where things are going, and then those that, that fit in that 4% uh, have embraced uh, ARA. Moving on. So, yeah, this, Daniel, I have, I have been, ahead. you know, in a former life, I was a release manager. Um, yeah. And, man, I got to tell you, you know, those, those weekend-long bridge calls, where you've got everybody, 36 yeah. hours nonstop. Um, you know, a lot of these folks they might not even understand that it's possible to automate this whole thing. Yeah, they, they so, just you know doesn't even click for them. That would have made a perfect poll question, right? How many developers, <laughs> uh, release managers, DBAs, uh, you know, uh, name it do you have on your release over a, a long weekend, you know, and I can guarantee you that 60, 70, even 80 percent, maybe more, will put their hands mm -hmm. up and go, yep, we agree, we know it's a painful, uh, you know, it's it's a pain point for, for a lot of people out there. Mm -hmm. uh, Gardner came up with a recent, uh, actually not recent, uh, 2015 survey showing that ARA uh, is one of the most important Technologies that has been identified, you know, to 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 get the adoption of DevOps uh, started in an organization. So it shows you that, yeah, you know, th there's this move towards getting DevOps. Well, what is the real driving technology? What is the real driving factor mm -hmm. in ARA? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yep. But I, I, I'll tell you, you know, we we abs you know, I would look at the market and I would look at, at certainly our customers. And they are, they're getting it. You know, they realize that they have got to move um, and, and adopt application release automation. Um, and, you know, the release managers, the application folks, lowercase a, you know, are really excited. And uh, so what we put up here, though, is this is a picture of a uh, database administrator being invited to a um, ARA implementation meeting. Um, <laughs> So what's happening, what we're starting to see is that, you know, the folks that were on those bridge calls are no longer on those bridge calls. And it's leaving the other folks in the organization um, around. You know, they have to be on it. Um, you know, and that's why we're talking about the evolution of ARA. Um, it's no longer can we take that compiled bit of code and move it out. Uh, it's bigger than that. And when we don't have ARA for everybody, when we are not, um, it, you know, bringing in other parts of the other parts of the organization, we wind up having the Lucy and Ethel moment here. So, yep. you know, we can't show a video of this, you know, for our audience because uh, of lag and things like that. But just to refresh your memory, you know, Lucy and Ethel decided that they wanted to work at a chocolate factory, and at the beginning, everything was great until the conveyor belt sped up. And I would argue that, you know, the other side of that wall in the kitchen are folks that have used uh, Zebia. They've implemented it, and everything's great. They're going to lunch. They're leaving the office at 5. Everything's wonderful. And then the other folks are like, hey, I need to get me some of that because they're getting killed. They're getting yeah. crushed. Yeah. So, I mean... Look, at the end of the day, you know, look, evolution, we, we certainly see this in, in software development. We, we have moved from 
you know, waterfall to agile. We're constantly improving how we get software out the door. Um, so, you know, we just need to understand that as we automate parts of our deployment, parts of our release, we need to not be satisfied with that. We need to keep going and, and include other parts of our business. And, and I think we would, you know, uh, Sunil and I would challenge you to our listeners that, you know, you need to think of this in don't think lowercase application. Don't think the stuff that comes out of Jenkins and that's driven by uh, Debian, all right? I want you to think uppercase application, the whole stack, all right? Don't, don't just, you know, not just the app server. Let's do the database. Let's do the network. Let's do all of those things and get yeah. to a point where we can have push button automation. Yeah. That's, that's where things get really cool. Agreed. Agreed. Um, it is the it is the full technology stack, as we say it, right? Uh, top to bottom, left to right. Um, you can't exclude one technology out of your uh, your release process or your release pipeline, so to speak. Oh, absolutely. Or else you're just lying to yourself. You're, you're yeah. saying, "Oh, we've automated everything." No, bro. No, you haven't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, and, and it's, 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 it's it is the truth, right? You, when you start looking at your full cycle. And you're taking mm -hmm. one application in today's world. Applications applications not only have dependencies within themselves, uh, but mm -hmm. outside the application itself. You know, with with middleware, middle tier applications, uh, messaging applications, business process rule engines, database mm -hmm. technologies, and then you start looking at infrastructure, and you start talking about changes to networking using maybe you know, F5 uh, changes, uh, maybe you have infrastructure related changes where you want to make or uh, build a machine up, right? Infrastructure is code, prime example. But it's the entire yeah. stack, right? And those critical elements, uh, especially on the database side, are things mm -hmm. that we constantly see being left out. Well, let's go ahead and see, um, Charlene, let's do this next poll question and we'll yeah. see what uh, the audience thinks about it. Yeah, so uh, you guys are all fired up. I didn't want to interrupt you because you're having such a great conversation. But uh, we, we yeah, take this so, stuff pretty seriously. <laughs> that's awesome. I think it's I think it's great. Um, the uh, second polling question is is now on your screen. It's does your organization run a continuous integration and continuous delivery process? And the answers are yes, no, but we plan to introduce this, or I don't know. So um, please uh, feel free to submit your answer. And we'll give you guys a couple more seconds, and then we'll take a look at the poll results. And then also, as a reminder, two reminders, actually. First of all, the poll results are also going to be tweeted out. So check your Twitter feed if you don't uh, see the results or we move too fast for you. Um, second one is uh, if you've got a question that, uh, for either Sunil or Robert, please feel free to send it in uh, via the control panel anytime. And here are the poll results. The majority of you say yes, your organization runs a continuous integration and continuous delivery process. And it looks like we have an extra R in integration. So. Oops. Um, but 32% uh, say that you uh, currently don't, but you plan to introduce this. So certainly um, that uh, section of the audience, that segment of the audience is, um, you know, hopefully uh, getting uh, a lot of really uh, useful information from this webinar. So guys, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you and uh, you guys can continue your conversation. Great. Uh, so I actually, actually yeah. have something, uh, Robert, before we go ahead. So about yeah, yeah, two years sure. ago, Gartner had a report that they put out. They had a nice little graphic that showed how companies were adopting continuous integration, right? And today we saw 66% saying we have continuous integration. That particular report showed 55%. So you can mm -hmm. see the gradual adoption of continuous integration, right? Mm -hmm. The next stage is continuous delivery. But without yep. actual application release automation and talking about your entire stack, you actually can't get to continuous delivery. So people are doing continuous integration. They're doing it really well, but it's secluded to small um, environments, right? Maybe you're... you're, mm -hmm. you're development integration environment uh, and the whole idea behind using build once deploy many people are still working on trying to adopt that 
Oh, absolutely. And, and look, and you have to. There's just too much pressure right now. Number of apps are increasing. The releases are increasing. So, yep. you know, look, the companies that adopt this are going to thrive and do well. The ones that don't, um, well, I don't think they'll be around to answer those poll questions anymore. And so <laughs> by, by, by definition, the number will go up. Um, yeah. You know, no, you, you, what, you'll see that you'll see that um, you know over time, people that don't adopt uh, automation, right? When we talk about ARA, there's a lot of automation that goes behind it. But mm -hmm. you know, companies that don't start to adopt continuous integration, uh, continuous testing, continuous delivery, uh, you know, in their ARA, in the scope of their their ARA implementation. Um, You'll see those people starting to lag behind and get mm -hmm. overtaken by, com uh, by companies that are far more agile, far more automated. Yeah, you know. for sure. Well, for the folks that want to catch up, we've got two slides here. Um, and this is based on a, um, a report that Gartner did. And they really talked about, you know, uh, uh, what do you need to do to uh, develop a, a DevOps tool chain? And there's a lot of analysts here. So what, what Sunil and I did on these next two slides is we kind of teased it apart and what really it's trying to say. Okay. And, and you know, I'll take the first one here is, is that when you're evaluating, um, you know, your DevOps tool chains, you cannot balkanize them. All right. So what I'm talking about is have, you know, little fiefdoms where different parts of the organization choose their own tool. All right. So you can't have one part of the company using, uh, you know, one ARA solution and the other using another one, all right? You, you got to come together. You're going to have to make a decision. But there has to be flexibility, all right? If you are going to pick one tool, you know, it has to be able to support multiple tech preferences. So you got some folks, you know, these are kind of lame examples, but some people like Ant, some people like Maven, fine. That's an easy one. But what about .NET versus Java? You know, you got to be able to support both of them. Exactly. And, and this is a, this is kind of a come together kumbaya moment uh, for your organization. Um, there's going to have to be some give and take uh, on both sides. Uh, yeah. Sunil, have you seen that? Have you seen different yeah, groups? Absolutely. So you think about an organization, right? You might have 15 different development teams each team using a different technology to make things happen for the applications that they're developing, that they're supporting, right? And you'll see one team might use Ant, you know, for for their build, uh, another one using Maven, another one using Cradle, right? One team mm -hmm, developing mm -hmm. .NET and using only Microsoft technologies, another one using Java, right? Uh, and any, any surrounding technologies around Java. But the idea here is that to be able to actually make things work, you have to be able to support any and every technology. That goes for database stuff too, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. .NET is Microsoft SQL, right? But out of the box, mm -hmm. they want to support that. Uh, if you look at Java, they need support for MySQL or Oracle, right? Uh, these are database technologies that uh, exist today. They proliferate across an organization and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're supported for reasons, right? But you have to be able mm -hmm. to support in your pipeline. Yeah. Absolutely good point. Yeah, you got to get, everybody's got to be involved. And, and to that point, you know, it can't just be one organization, you know, or a handful. There, there's got to be, you got to look forward. So you have to involve the folks that are picking the new technologies, like the Enterprise Architecture Group. But at the same time, don't forget those mainframe folks. Don't forget the folks, you know, on the old stuff because I got to tell you, those apps aren't going away. They're going to stick around, um, and there's a reason why they stick around. They make a lot of money for our companies. Yeah. And so we've got to be future-proof and backwards compatible. It's key. Yeah. Mainframe is a prime example. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, look, man, if it was going to go away, it would have gone away already. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I guess I kind of tease up that last one, you know, uh, absolutes are absolutely awful. 
we will be 100% in the cloud in five years. No, you won't. You might be 90. Yeah. You might be 95%. But there's going to be something, something that stays behind just yeah. for business needs, contractual obligations, who knows what. So, yeah. I mean, involve everybody and talk. I agree. I, I love the 80-20 rule here, right? So never commit to 100%, but you can say 80%, yeah, and then work on that 20% that, that's giving you the biggest pain points, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you decide that, uh, you know, you're going to go from MySQL to Oracle, right, in mm -hmm. two years. That migration path might take you more than two years, but you can start working on it and say, target 80% of your applications to migrate over to Oracle, right? That 20 that have dependencies or certain things that kind of stop them from moving uh, to Oracle, uh, you might have an opportunity to maybe re-architect, right? Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. Saying 100%, you know, in the cloud, for example, uh, technology is changing at an extremely fast rate to predict that far. Uh, is 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 not a good idea, right? You can you can say maybe a year, two years down the road, uh, mm -hmm. you know. But but have a plan, you know. And, yeah, and you allow, know. allow for errors, you know, because you're gonna you're gonna make there's gonna be a lot of <laughs> trial and error. Well, that's how we learn, you know. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's how I learned to walk by falling on my butt a lot. <laughs> I think we all. So did. This, yeah. So this, this next one is, is a little bit more from that article. And, um, you know, I, again, it, you know, we're kind of, you know, again, expanding. You know, this, this cannot be a solution um, that is chosen by the DevOps team, all right? It has to be a lot of folks. And we've got to include all these stakeholders because if we do it based on one small group's needs, it's going to be focused on their choice, and a yep. lot of the times that that just doesn't work. You know, uh, uh, you know, I know, I know it's a cliche. It takes a village. Need all the folks around. But yep. you know, Sunil, can you can you talk about like what happens when when Zevia goes and and talks to uh, somebody about your solution? I mean, I mean, you guys yep. bring in a lot of different folks, don't you? Absolutely. So, you know, our approach here has been to get everybody involved, right? You have people from the business side, the, you know, when we talk about business side, we, we kind of group the release managers, right? The, the managers, the team leads, the executive management as the business side. And then you start talking about the technical managers, the development managers, uh, the actual developers, the DBAs, the, um, you know, the middleware admins, the infrastructure guys, but you have to bring everybody uh, into, the, into the mix because you don't have the big picture if you only have the developer who says, yep, my CI uh, solution works just fine, right? Because he's concentrating only on his piece mm -hmm. at that point. So when you start really peeling the onion and start looking at every layer, you find that you know, the onion is either rotten in between or you know, <laughs> or you have layers are missing, right? Or the layers are yeah. just too thick to penetrate anywhere further, right? But we actually make it a point to get, you know, as many layers of, of the functions uh, involved in the whole process. The tool chain uh, can't be governed by one small team, right? It is a conglomeration mm -hmm. of, of folks, of stakeholders, just like you said, it takes a village. Think about a village. You have all mm -hmm. sorts of people in a village, and it takes all sorts to run that village, right? It's the same yeah. concept. Absolutely. One of, one of the mental, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, little mental exercise I like to take folks through is very quickly I ask them to sketch out their application architecture. Uh, very simple. And, and typically it winds up being three boxes and two sticks, right? Web yeah. server, application server, database, mm -hmm. and then I always ask, like, okay, where's where where are the database folks? You know, yeah. where where are my application DBAs or my sys DBAs? And you know, I that's again, this is part of the evolution. You know, we it's wonderful that we're able to automate the application, 
Um, it, it, it's wonderful that we're able to, to, to take something that took hours and hours and, and take it down to seconds. Yep. Um, but it's not enough. We've got to keep going, guys. We've got to keep going. Uh, just getting there, uh, saving half the company's time isn't enough. Um, we've got to keep going. No, I, I agree with you. And the last point, automate everything, including the database, is the is you, you know, it's the nail on the coffin, right? Because most people always think about automating the application and the deployment of the application. But then when we get to the database, oh, stop! We have to get the DBA involved. But in reality, even that portion can actually be automated. Mm hmm. Well, what do we have next? What are we talking about next? I think if I'm, uh, 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 what, here we why? go. I love why? this one. <laughs> why are we even including these? <laughs> no, no, no. This was, why does this happen? The, the, right. the, the question was, why do we forget these things? You know, yeah. what is going on in our organizations that makes us uh, kind of forget these folks? And, and the first yeah. one this is easy. You know, yeah. siloed functions, right? Why is it happening? Um, frankly, it's, you know, silos. We don't see it. Uh, we're doing our job, and, and Sunil, you were just talking about that, the application developers. They're, okay, man, this is good for me. Yeah. I'm happy. Yeah. Um, no and issues you find, here. Yeah, you find this all the time. We find this all the time, right? So you go to a, to a customer, and you find that, you know, you'll talk to a specific uh functions, uh, you know, or team, uh, and you find that there is no DBA involved at all. Why? Because the DBAs are in their own little group, and, you know, they're never involved until the last moment, and the last moment being when they, when somebody needs a database created, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And they have to go through this whole process of requesting a database or a change, mm -hmm. right, which takes forever. Uh, so siloed mm -hmm. functions are a, one of the biggest factors. Hey, you can see this movement when you, when you start talking about, you know, the whole DevOps movement, right? Trying to integrate mm -hmm. any functions into a team, and that really includes integrating your DBA function into a team. Mm -hmm. you know? So break down, break down those silos. Yeah, but you know, to some extent, it's kind of the database administrator and database developers fault to some extent you know and I've certainly seen this it's the don't touch my stuff attitude um, right. you know it, it's oh this is mine stay away and that you know what I got to tell you it worked great it worked great um, you know uh, late 90s early 2000s uh, yeah. when we had quarterly releases and we needed the world's most advanced computer to look at every single one of these database changes. It worked. It was great. B bad stuff didn't get through, all right? But not cutting it anymore. You've got to no. move faster. And these guys are getting crushed. And what has once was don't touch my stuff um, has morphed a bit. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's no longer, it's, it's like, uh, okay, you can touch a little bit of my stuff. And we've yeah. seen DBAs start to say, okay, well, you can touch dev and test, yeah. and, but not production, you know? Yeah. But it's, another it's, thing is... It, it, it is natural, right? It, it's that human factor saying, look, I've built this thing. It's mine, right? And <laughs> yeah. I know what's going on, right? So I don't need you to tell me how to do my job. Yeah. Now, the reality is that, you know, like you said, with a little bit of coaxing, right, we can have the developers start to play around in the dev environments, right? You might add some mm -hmm, different mm -hmm. controls as you move up the chain into dev, uh, into test, the QA, or staging and production environments, right? That that level of control increases, but we are starting to see that, um, you know, yeah, as, but as things are evolving. Yeah, but sometimes they just don't want to do it. They say it's too hard. It's like, right. you know what, I'm going to write code. I don't want to mess with this stuff. I don't want to deal with, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the intricacies of crafting efficient indexes and, and the like. I want to stay away, you know? Yeah. And, and to some extent, they're, they're, some developers are quite happy 
Um, yeah. They also might be a little scared. You know, you mess with the database, that's the most valuable thing that companies own, the data, right? I mean, applications change, um, but the data stays. Um, you, can ch you can go from mainframe green screen terminal to client server to web to mobile and still have the same back-end database. That yeah. data's still there. Look at Sabre, still, still running the same architecture. But yep. the airline reservations system, it's still, you know, the front end has changed, but the back yeah. end has it. And that's scary. People don't want to touch that. Yep. You can only imagine what kind of scary stuff happens in the back end on that, <laughs> on that system. <laughs> yeah, you touch one thing, it breaks something else, man. Yeah, exactly. So, so Sineo, Sineo, can you break it down for us? Like, why is this orchestration so important? So yeah, ARA release orchestration, right? the idea is to really cut down your time to market, right? We've had companies where we've brought our tools in uh, and gone from six months releases down to under a month, right? That's huge. Think of, think of just the implication of that, right? Six months of work down to under a month. Uh, the amount of people engaged during those six months down to you know one or two people monitoring a release uh, at the end of that one month cycle so enterprises that implement release orchestration often reduce the time to release a software for months down to days or even hours that's a given uh, they mm -hmm. frequently release software at much much higher rates 10 to 20 times more quickly you know just a few months after implementing uh, release orchestration well Sunil, I mean look it's obvious to me why that's a good thing but can for the folks that might not understand why releasing faster is good can you break it down like what it means for the business but you know in today's market you know, if you're not evolving your technology at a fast pace you're going to be either eaten up you're going to go out of business, right? Uh, or some other technology is just going to come and overtake you so fast uh, that you won't know what hit you. Uh, prime example, Blockbuster, Netflix. <laughs> okay? Think about it, right? So Netflix today, I mean, Netflix not only ate Blockbuster, chewed them out and threw them out. Uh, I have another term for it, but I'm not going to say it here. Uh, <laughs> But think about what Netflix does today, right? They literally deploy tens of thousands of releases per day. Obviously, they're doing something right to be able to support that sort of infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, to add to that, uh, software quality not only improves dramatically, but it actually, you know, th through the through the multiple cycles that it lets you do at a much higher pace, you're improving your quality. And you're actually doing this whole shift left mentality where, where your quality is engaged from the time a developer checks in their code, right? Uh, it's not a quality, is it, it, not an issue when it only goes to production. It's at every single stage. Well, you, you heard it, folks. Just like uh, you got to evolve your business, you got to evolve your view of ARA. So, Sunil, how are we going to fix it, man? How are we going to make this stuff go away? Uh, so, uh, obviously, we're we're here to not only promote our products, right? But we're here to make a point. The fact is that you have to have uh, your database changes as part of your of your release cycle, right? So, how do you actually enable that? Use ARA technologies, right? Uh, XZB Labs. Uh, this is what we do. Our Excel release product is the release orchestration tool of choice. Gardner said it, Forrester has said it, and that's why we are with companies like those listed on the, you know, on the screen. Expedia, Paychex, KLN was our first client. You know, Priceline. Uh, we have big names. The fact is we can actually orchestrate all your tools including you know tools like data goals DB right to bring in database changes into the whole release cycle <clears throat> Let's, 
Oh, Sunil, let me know when I need to go to the next one. Yeah, let's go on to the next slide here. Okay. Sorry, man. No, that's fine. So Xavier Labs uh, has three tools, specifically one for release orchestration uh, to get visibility into your release pipelines. Uh, the other one is around deployment automation. Uh, it's called Excel Deploy, and this kind of automates and standardizing your complex uh, application deployments. Uh, Excel Test View is our test data aggregation tool and provides you with analysis uh, you know, on your test results across not only your multiple uh, test tools, but you know, it disparate tools, disparate teams, uh, it kind of aggregates all that uh, test da data and provides you with one uh, enterprise-wide tool uh, view. Uh, next slide. Sure thing. So this is kind of how Excel release sits over, uh, over the entire DevOps tool chain that you might have. Uh, you know, we go from planning to operations, but you can see that there's a whole bunch of tools uh, within this uh, that are being orchestrated within the whole uh, tool chain, right? And so within this, you, you could have Datacool DB as one of those pieces um, that connects up to Excel release uh, to be orchestrated. Uh, underneath that, we have... Um, you know, uh, Excel Deploy actually connects out to uh, infrastructure ser uh, services like AWS or uh, Azure, uh, Open OpenShift, OpenStack. Uh, provides you know high-level visibility to all your processes underneath and tools underneath. Next slide. So, what does Excel Release offer? We offer you know. Uh, the ability to orchestrate across not only multiple people uh, or teams, uh, the, but processes and your tools. You start adding people, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that whole people process tools uh, concept, right? Excel release orchestrates all that for you. And I think this diagram here kind of shows you a little bit of that, but the idea behind being able to connect all these pieces together uh, using one tool uh, and provide the metrics that goes behind that is is a huge benefit uh, to an uh, to an organization. Oh, for sure, for sure. Next slide. Next slide. All right, here we go. We have another poll question. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so our third and final poll question. Woohoo! Woohoo! All right. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, sorry, we do have our final poll question. A little frog in my throat there. The question is, does your organization automate its database change man management and deployment process? So we do have four answers for you. Um, pretty simple, yes, no, but we plan to introduce this. No, and we do not plan to introduce this, or I don't know. So we uh, give you guys a couple seconds, a couple more seconds to uh, answer, and then we'll take a look at the poll results. I also want to remind you guys that uh, we are going to be tweeting out the results of the polls. And uh, also, if you do have a question for either Robert or Sunil, please uh, feel free to get your questions in. OK, so here are the poll results. Uh, looks like no, but we plan to introduce this is the big winner for this particular poll question, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, guys, what, what, do you take of, what do you make of these results? Oh, that's why they're wasting their time on this webinar, I guess. <laughs> I wouldn't call it a waste of time, but <laughs> well, you know, Troy. I mean, these guys look like their hair's on fire right now. They're all checking their email, like, oh, look at all these tickets piling up. Oh, yeah. yep. Oh, these guys. Would these guys get on with it? Uh, <laughs> no. It, it, look, that's what we're starting to see. We, you know, like what uh, Sunil was talking about earlier with uh, the Gartner Forrester stuff coming out. Um, you know, and, and this is the first year that they have, okay, put together their magic quadrant and wave, you know, picking out the, the real rock star winners like Zevia Labs in ARA. Um, the market is getting this. People are realizing that this is something that's important. Well, that's, that's great, but now that you've done this, you need to take that next step in evolution. You need to say, okay, how much further can we take this? And like I was saying earlier, that three-block, two-stick diagram, the database is the next stop. 
That that is once you've automated this and gotten benefit out of it, the next place to get ROI, the next place to improve, is is a no brainer. The database. Yep, agreed completely. I mean, this poll question right here tells you that. <laughs> you know, people are thinking about it or are mm -hmm. are dipping their feet into it, right? So it's right yeah. there. Now, Sunil, one thing I want to do though is I want to concentrate on that eight percent. I want to I want to speak to all my 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 brothers and sisters that said they had no plan, and I want to convince them that they want to start considering a plan to automate. Go for it. So, so let's see if this works. Okay. Um, so look, you know, we're moving fast. All right. We we I mentioned the Facebook example, and uh, things are looking up. Things are looking up for QA and application development. You know. Our, our line of business executives that own the app are pleased. Uh, they like the fact that requirements gathering involves telling stories. Uh, we have broken the wall down between business and development. You know, things are looking really good. Uh, we're getting more apps out, uh, faster releases. Unfortunately, we are killing our DBAs. All right. So four out of five application deployments include some sort of database change, adding a column, updating the stored procedure, you name it, okay? Uh, that is from our customers, Datable uh, customers. That's what they're telling us. Right now, it is manual, all right? Even if you've written a script, a SQL script to execute this stuff, you still have to manually execute the script, all right? It's risky, and this is a part of your business that cannot scale exponentially, right? It scales linearly. What I mean is if you have 10 DBAs making 200 changes a week, right, to go to 400, you're gonna have to double the number of DBAs, all right? It's not something where you could add more servers or increase you resources in the cloud. You can't do that. You have got to hire people, and that is very, very difficult to manage, and something that, that Frankly, we might not be ready to do, all right? So what we've come up with over a Datacle is a way that you can, you know, treat these database changes as code, all right? So database code deployments is just as easy as the application code deployments, all right? The other thing we're going to do is we're going to protect better than a person manually reviewing these scripts, okay? We're going to release risks that can lead to downtime and security vulnerabilities. And what that means is that you're going to be able to have these DBAs, these database developers, these database administrators, focus on higher value tasks, all right, that move the business forward. They're going to focus on scalability, disaster recovery, performance, security, those sorts of things that eventually move to the cloud. They're going to be able to do these things that actually increase revenue and cut costs instead of just answering help desk t tickets that say, can you add a column? To this table. So let, let's talk about how it kind of how it works. Okay. So the first thing that happens is that we're with Datacle DB, we remove that back and forth. All right. And, and everybody that's done this knows what I'm talking about. Dev says, okay, I'm ready for a push. All right. Here are the objects I need you to push. So some DBA needs to cull through a development database and, and pick out what needs to go. And then they move it to QA. And guess what? We've got Zevia Labs pushing out our application. It fires up. Crap. We have a problem. We forgot something. So we have to cycle through again and go back to the database. We're eliminating that back and forth. All right. So when you deploy the application, when you push it with Zevia, you're going to push data with DB. That's going to update test stage production. We're going to integrate with the tools and processes that you have today. But the real value here is, is, I would argue, is validating changes, okay? We're able to forecast changes. We're able to see what's going to be persisted to that database before we actually do it. We're able to apply rules to enforce standards. We're able to do a lot of the stuff that basically nasty emails from DBAs are the things that enforce it today. Um, and, and, and I've actually seen this. I've seen DBA shopping before at, um, at our customer sites where we have an application developer 
knows that they are trying to do something naughty to a database, and they will actually try and find the least experienced DBA to see if they can slip it through. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and we eliminate that. All right. So one of the things that we'll you know do it for those you know, the professionals, all right, the database professionals, I mean, the database developers, the database administrators, is we're getting rid of that review of the scripts, okay? We're, being, we're able to show you a report, apply rules that can say things like follow this naming convention or do not add an index that comprises more than three columns, for example, or do not add a column with the default value set. You know, in some instances with large tables that can cause a DML lock, we stop that. The thing that we're doing for the, the, you know, that business owner is, you know, they're able to get their stuff out faster. They're not having to wait weeks. That's what, you know, from, I, I've heard in the market that some people are waiting months to get a change into a production database. And, and we're also helping out the dev and QA folks, all right? It's just faster. They don't have to wait on somebody else. We're seeing a decrease in, in far less time on these tasks and a lot fewer deployment errors. Let's go on to the next slide here. And uh, you know what? I think it's question time. <laughs> I think we've got a whole bunch of questions that are loading up. And what yeah. I'm going to do is I'm going to put up the uh, you know more information stuff here um, while we answer some questions. Yeah, great. So, um, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to walk all over you there. Um, I did want to go ahead and let the audience know, though, um, that if you haven't submitted your question and you'd like to, we, we do have you know, a good 15 minutes here. So um, please go ahead and submit your question, and we'll do our best to uh, answer it on uh, during, during the webinar here. But let's go ahead and take a look at the, um, uh, the questions that we have gotten so far. And the first one is actually for uh, you, Robert, and it, sound, it says, oh. it sounds like uh, it, it, there's a lot more work for the DBA. So how do you make sure that bad database changes aren't pushed to production? Oh, uh, let, me, let me see if I can make sure I understand it. So it, it's um, by, let me answer it this way, okay? <laughs> with 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 Datical DB, what we're able to do is we're able to push a lot of the responsibility for authoring these changes to the dev team. Okay. Now there's risk associated with that. There's risk associated that they could do some chuckleheaded stuff, you know, and that's okay. We all make mistakes, you know. Not pointing fingers. It is what it is. Um, so I, I think what's important is our ability, one, to forecast these changes in dev and test. And that allows us to generate a report. And we would expect that with, you know, something like DBA Labs, you could route that report to the DBA so they could view it ahead of time. Um, also, with our rules engine, the DBAs can write rules. And it's pr pretty simple stuff. You know, we've got hundreds and hundreds of examples there but can write rules to stop the things that they don't like. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. We had one customer that said if every, if there's a column that ends in underscore FLG flag, it needs to be car byte size two. All right. They wanted to say it's just one character um, in that column. Uh, now, I don't know if I agree with that. I, I use a check constraint. Um, but um, that's what they wanted, and we said, no problem. And, and that was an annoyance that just caused them no end of hassle and heartache. So with the rules, with the forecast, um, DBAs can prevent naughty things getting into production. I hope I answered that right. If I didn't, please answer in the, or, or say something in chat, and, and I'll try to put a finer point on it. Okay. All right. Great. Well, um, let's let's be fair about this. So I do have a question now for Sunil, who uh, I let's see. Let me scroll down to it. I apologize. Um, it's right here. It's it says you talk a lot about automation, which is great in theory, but there are parts <coughs> of my process where I don't see it being feasible. 
So how do, you, uh, how do your technologies address scenarios that have a mix of manual and automated tasks? Absolutely. So Excel release actually was designed uh, to provide checks and balances across your release cycle. And the way we do that is what we call control tasks. We have manual control tasks, we have automated, we have scripted, um, and I think what you're trying to get at is the manual control tasks. These are tasks where during your release cycle you need input uh, from a release manager. Or like Robert said, maybe you need to send something to a DBA. Uh, those, those are kind of tasks where the release cycle stops and is waiting for somebody to log into the system, provide that feedback, and either approve or disapprove um, you know, uh, whatever it is that, that's assigned to that person, and then move on to the next stage. So Excel release provides you the ability to stop your release through manual checks and balances uh, by, by using what we call uh, control tasks uh, in general. I hope that kind of answered your question. It's a very okay. generic answer. But <laughs> no, but it was gen generic or not, it answered the question, so that's great. Okay, Robert, this one's for you. You ready? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, we had a, a question uh, that says, I get it, but not sure my bosses get it. So what do you suggest <laughs> for getting their attention? All right. Um, have you tried buying them booze? <laughs> well, I don't know if that's legal sometimes. <laughs> I don't know. It depends on your state. I know. Um, <laughs> we're, we're based in Texas. That works a lot. Um, you know, my favorite one is uh, never waste a crisis, all right? Look, bad, oh, bad things happen to good servers, right? Um, and when you are doing your post-mortem, your inevitable post-mortem for something that didn't get done on time or there was an issue, that is the time to bring it up, all right? Now, you got to understand that the folks that are on the front lines, typically a bit younger than our managers and executives, they've been around a little bit longer, and you know, they have the uh, uh, um, benefit of experience, they might not have the benefit of vision though. And so when you pick the right time, when something bad happens, I'm not saying while it's happening, <laughs> notice I said post-mortem, all right, wait right. till it's all cleaned up. <laughs> All right, uh, nobody hates the guy that's like when the house is on fire, it's like, man, you really should have had a smoke detector. Um, but um, it, 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 when it's over, that is the time to say, during the postmortem, that is the appropriate time. We should really evaluate solutions to automate this. Perhaps we can bring some folks in and show us some stuff. That's the time to do it. Um, you know, I, I would go for wait for the right time, never waste a crisis, and the soft sell. Just say, hey, this thing might be interesting. Um, it's going to take a while because, you know, there, there is, remember the Y slide? Siloed functions, not my problem. You know, there, there's a lot of accretive crust built up that you're going to have to break through to get some change, but it is worth it. Okay, great. Well, I think... Um I think that answers the question very succinctly and doesn't involve alcohol, so that's always a bonus <laughs> there. <laughs> so, Sunil, I've got another one for you. After sure. Excel release implementation, how do you measure speed to market? So, one of the, one of the things that we'd seen when we put Excel release, uh, you know, uh, uh, at a customer site is we map out their processes and they start running their releases and they quickly find the inefficiencies in their process, right? And Excel release by default provides a lot of reporting, uh, how long a release has taken, uh, what phases a release might be taking the longest in, and even more granular to that is how long a particular task might be taking and how long um, or, or, or what's failing more often, right? So those kind of metrics allow companies to really assess uh, what their release process looks like or their release orchestration looks like and plug those holes more effectively, right? Because now everything is visible. It's in your face uh, as opposed to trying to dig out 
you know, uh, where things might be failing. So our ability to actually provide those metrics right out of the box um, is actually a huge benefit to companies and that's how we kind of help improve your time to market because you're plugging your inefficiencies at a much higher rate than you normally would. Great. Okay. So I looking at the time here, doing a time check, we got about five minutes left. So I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So um, Robert, I'm going to throw this one over the wall to you again. Um, somebody uh, wrote in, when we suggested automating database changes, our architects said no way. So can we skip over them? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. And, and, and I will... I, I love this question, okay, and, and I'm, I'm glad, I'm starting to see it more and more, all right, and I'm excited by this, okay, because this is the, we don't do it that way, okay. Um, one of our customers, very large customers, uh, I think maybe about 35% of our audience has them in their wallet, uh, had a challenge around this area, okay, and um, they, uh, some folks were saying, we just don't do it that way. And they said, okay, no problem, all right? Uh, Datable has the ability to export SQL scripts, all right? And um, that was the big challenge. They, they, one was the authoring of the SQL scripts, all right? So we have an object model that, that is very easy to keep in sync and, uh, with development. And that's why the developers wanted it and the release guys wanted it. Um, the uh, uh, data architects, the, the DBAs were like, nope, nope, just give it SQL scripts. Okay. Well, the floodgates were open. Okay, the dam had burst, and they were changing and going, going, going. Um, pretty soon they said, uh, hey, uh, we, uh, oh, okay. Oh, I, I just saw this, this change here. Okay, the person, we're getting lifetime feedback. All right. They said it's not what I meant. Uh, they wanted to automate. It's just that they had their own automated process. Okay. Well, fair enough. If it doesn't work for you, uh, we have this rule at our house. Okay, with my wife and my kid. All right. And the rule at our house is, if it doesn't work for everybody, it doesn't work for anybody. All right. Um, at some point, remember the stuff I said earlier that Sunil and I were talking about. Like, you need to figure out a way to make it a village, okay? Um, at some point, if they are holding you back from improving your release processes, you got to go higher. You're going to have to go and talk to dad, go talk to the principal, and bring somebody in that says, look, it's not good enough, all right? It, it's great that they have a process, but you got to go higher. Sorry, I misunderstood. Charlene, do we have one more question? Yes, we have one other quick question, and then we'll have to close things out. Um, the uh, Let's see. Um, if code and schema chart changes, I think this is Robert, this one is for you also. So if code and schema okay. chart changes are tightly coupled, um, does, how does the data datacal product help to automate these schema changes? Oh, we want them coupled. All right, the first thing is you check your datacal project into the same source code uh, repository. And when that build happens, all right, when, when, when ZB Labs is, is doing the compilation and creating that release package that uh, Deploy can take, it is going to um, align them by default, all right? All database changes and all code changes are tightly coupled, so you've got to start from the beginning. Check them into the same repository. And uh, we have got a ton of features and functionality to align them even tighter with labels and context um, uh, to the code. So absolutely, it should be checked into the same source code repository so that your build and deployment tools uh, that you purchase from Zebia Labs uh, can take advantage of them. Perfect. Perfect. Well, um, uh, we got so many questions in and, and um, it's kind of a drag that we can't get to every single one of them here, but uh, I'm sure uh, the, uh, both Sunil and Robert will take a look at the questions and if they can uh, 
send you a message or, or send you uh, an answer to your question, they'll, they'll be happy to do so. Just put you Absolutely. guys on the spot there. So, um, <laughs> so with that, I would like to thank both Sunil and Robert for taking part in today's webinar. And I hope the audience, uh, you guys got as much out of it as I did. So great conversation, guys. Great information. Um, the, uh, the, the resources page uh, is still up on the screen. So if you guys are li uh, looking forward to or l interested in continuing the conversation with these guys, please feel free to. And uh, once again, a reminder that uh, the webinar and the slides are going to be uh, available on the DevOps.com site uh, roughly 24 hours after the webinar. So um, check back maybe this time tomorrow. We'll see. Um, but for now, um, I would like to, again, thank Robert and Sunil for joining us, and thank you for joining us, and I hope to talk to you soon. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Thanks. Thank you very much.